I'm just going to go ahead and get started on our question and answer panel. So uh, I have four awesome people here who are all going to introduce themselves to you. And um, then we're going to start with some internal questions and then turn it over to you guys for some more discussion topics. So Craig, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Craig Robinson, and I am not a successful game audio creator. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an audio creator at all. I'm a developer. Um, but I work with uh, sound designers and engineers and have um, some concept of uh, what it takes to make great audio within games. My name is Nick Thomas. I'm the founder of Somatone, and we've been in the game audio business for about 10 years now, mostly working on casual games uh, for that whole time. Um, I'm Fernando. Uh, Mike. I got a mic back here. Oh, look what? at you. Uh, I'm Fernando, um, lead sound designer at Z2. We do uh, mostly iOS games. Oh, uh, my name is Jesse Holt, and I am the audio director at Double Down Interactive and one of the co-founders of Absolute Hero Games, and um, I'm pleased to be here. Awesome. All right, so let's just dive right in. So why are we doing this? Uh, what, are, what is the purpose, and what are the rules of this panel? So we're trying to provide information to budding game designers, game audio designers, as well as people who have been in the industry for a while. Um, we want to elevate the worth and the perceived worth of what we do so that people will pay us their money for their big budget games or whatever budget they have because we do awesome things and create awesome audio. And uh, so we want to tell you all about that. Um, we're trying to solve some problems, like there's been a lot of talk about HTML5 today. It's awesome. I've never heard of this audio sprite thing. I think it's really cool. So this sort of thing is really useful to a lot of people. I saw a lot of people go up to you afterwards. Um, we're just going to be open, honest, receptive, <coughs> respectful, and let's, uh, you know, we can disagree. Let's get heated. Let's get it interesting in here. And uh, let's not try to prove how awesome and smart we are. Let's just be awesome and smart, OK? And don't shamelessly market yourself, OK, Jesse? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Those are our rules, so let's go into some topics. So um, this is just a big list of like things that have to do with clients, getting them, keeping them, working with them. Um, how many clients do you usually work with at once? How many projects do you juggle at once? Anyone who wants to jump in? Nick. <laughs> We're more of a team. Not, I'm not a, an individual composer. Mm -hmm. um, we probably have. 50, uh, mm -hmm. but it sounds like a lot, but these are projects that live on and have a trickle of content needs for sometimes years. Mm -hmm. uh, so active at any given time, it's probably half that. Right. Uh, but they stay on our list just to support for sometimes years. Right. So yeah, as an individual sound provider, I usually work on probably around eight at a time. It's a lot different than 50 as a team. Right, but it's not, yeah, there's no one person who's, it's right. probably about eight per person, actually. That there you seems go. like a max. That's about that's where lot. I start to go insane. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> when we budget for games internally, we typically um, assume that one sound designer can support between four and six games. Gotcha. Yeah, that sounds about right with you too. I mean, most of our games are live. You know, we update them, I don't know, probably monthly or bi-monthly. So just supporting them plus the games that um, we're producing currently. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything to add, Jesse? Everyone else talked, I'm just saying. Oh, all right. Well, um, typically at Double Down, I'm working on, uh, in, in nice, healthy, strong production cycles, working on about three to four games, mm -hmm. um, which is really easy to to do actually because mm -hmm. pretty much they're all kind of have their own vibe and you know spirit so it's easy to to look at this and focus on it for a few hours and then shift over here and focus on that for a few hours and you know do that day in and day out okay good all right so this question won't <coughs> pertain to you so much jesse or maybe not to you fernando because you're kind of in-house but for you nick i guess um how do you find new clients, and how do you keep new clients, and what do you think are the most important tools that sound designers and composers who are trying to get work can use? Wow, that's a 
That's a big question. Um, finding and keeping clients, I mean, that's you know, just sort of basic business development. Um, going to conferences like this and just meeting people is important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, it's a little different now because we've, we've built a bit of a reputation. So, you know, we have a portfolio and, um, you know, people are maybe aware of who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're coming into the space, I, I think one of the best ways to show people what you can do is to take an existing game that does not sound good and reskin it and bring it to the client with what you could have done, mm -hmm. uh, what's possible. A lot of people in this space, I don't think, understand what's possible. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of just take what they have. Um, showing them what it could be mm -hmm. is a, a great way to generate excitement. And even if they don't have a budget, you know, the next time it comes around, they'll probably mm -hmm. call you. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of it's a lot of leg work uh, at the beginning, but it then it build relationships and um, that's what it's all about relationships. right now a lot of developers have asked me or told me like hey I did this job and it's I did it for free because I'll get like rep reputation I'm in the industry or they'll do it for really cheap and I always tell people that's a really bad idea mm -hmm. because um, it really devalues what we all do um, and what we do is expensive and it requires a lot of skill that took a long time. Um, but I was just wondering what your take was on that. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't do a whole game. We would do like a minute. Mm -hmm. We do like an experience. Like this is what this battle should have felt like. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like this. And you know, how much better does this sound? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's really better and you're able to bring that, generally it opens people's eyes to what's possible. Right. And that begins the conversation about a scope and a budget and mm -hmm. um, paying for all that work. Okay. So while we're on this slide, are there any <coughs> questions about getting work in the industry at this time? Okay, so we need a mic runner. We're going to steal one of your mics temporarily. Well, we mm -hmm. need to record it for the online people. Right, online people? <laughs> Do you like that? You can use that sound effect. Uh, do, you, do you ever have to cold call companies? It's a good question. Um, well, kind of like what Nick said, I've been around for a while in this space, so generally people come to me. But uh, if there are new companies that I haven't heard of or that develop, you know, that get created, I usually go out of my way to introduce myself. So that would be cold calling, and that way I don't open a phone book and, <laughs> do you need game audio? Actually, I think LinkedIn is actually a really great tool for that kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. People are pretty receptive, and uh, if you can get past the kind of uh, filter of LinkedIn spam, mm -hmm. uh, if you can give them something compelling, then mm -hmm. that's a great way to cold call. Yeah, so and I, th I think that, that word spam is really important. There's a lot of ways to communicate, and there's a good way and a bad way, I think, with trying to get work, and like nobody just wants you to like heavily market them when they don't know you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's another thing to say, hey, you know, this is who I am, and I'm around, and this is what I do, and I would love to get to know what you guys do, and if you need some work, then I'm happy to submit you know, a demo, that kind of thing, rather mm -hmm. than just like, this big marketing brochure, you know, that's not going to fly. Probably keeping it personal is good, I find. In, in, in Seattle, at least, the, um, the casual games mar um, uh, industry there is, is kind of small, and everybody knows mm -hmm. one another. So, you know, creating uh, a situation where you have a favorable response for somebody, and you're kind and cordial, and you remember people's names, and, you know, you go to uh, meetups or mixers or, you know, whatever, you know, you chances are you're going to see the, those people again and you're going to have to interact with them again and because it is so small people do talk and people will you know kind of you know word of mouth is or I guess yeah word of mouth is mm -hmm. probably more valuable than a brochure yeah. I think and I've, I've had potential game company clients <coughs> tell me oh so and so just won't leave us an alone or so and so like wrote me five emails but you know, but I like that you don't do that or something. I mean, people do talk and they will tell your competition. So it just, it's about 
karma and respect. It's a small, it's a small world after all. <laughs> Why is everything a song? Another question over there. Hi, my name is Munir from uh, Lebanon. <coughs> a couple of my colleagues here as well from Lebanon. I think that the, the music part of gaming is so important, and it's so critical, it's so much fun, and yet there are only like eight of us in this room. And this is my first game conference, and uh, we're really interested in doing more stuff around the link between music and games, and I was wondering why, I mean, I thought that this room and these sessions would be packed and that people would be thrilled. I mean, there's so much amazing stuff that can be done with music, and music is such an intrinsic part of the, of the gameplay experience. Mm -hmm. Where the hell is everybody? <laughs> Amen. One, one, <laughs> one, of, one of the reasons why um, Aaron and I and uh, three other audio designers in the west coast of, of the United States started the Game Audio Alliance was primarily to do um, community um, you know, outreach and, and just try and you know, like be informative and, and whatnot, because uh, 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 it's very competitive, I think, you know, being an audio designer and a composer and, and wanting the work, it's very competitive. And, and mm -hmm. it, there's this certain, there's this certain uh, attitude in, in uh, musicians where it's like, you know, well, I'm a better guitar player than it is, and I'm gonna <laughs> turn my back so you can't see what I'm playing kind of thing. And even to a certain extent, audio designers are, and sound designers are also like that, mm -hmm. where you know, they don't really share information or knowledge because they don't want to lose a gig or they don't, don't want to lose a client. And that's something that, that Aaron and uh, you know, the, the three other guys and, uh, and I w are very um, aware of, is, is that you know, we need events like this to pull people together, to you know, know that there's, you know, we saw a lot of developers here earlier, and I, mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the best things that you know could happen um, I in something like this. Because composers are always going to come here, but developers need to be aware of you know just exactly how difficult it can be and how much time we put into it. And you know, I guess it's just it's just one of those things of, of uh, you know bringing awareness to the the games industry because a lot of people think that you know. You, and we've argued about, we've talked about this on panels before for the last six years, mm -hmm. that um, you get to a certain point and it's like, well, we've got the art for the game, we've got the code for the game, they're all working, the game's functioning, now let's go throw some you know, sound effects and some music in it. Yeah, and, and P.S., see there's only get. like 2% of the budget left at that point, too. Right, and then all of a sudden, you know, that's, that's where you, you get these instances where it's like, well, my brother's cousin is a <laughs> songwriter, and he can throw <laughs> some music up in there, and it's like, really? And the secretary can record the voiceovers. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, I, I, totally, I totally feel you. I, I totally get it, and, but you know, this is the first time that uh, uh, the audio track has been here at Casual Connect in Europe for what seven years. Since so, 2008. You know, r r write uh, write the people at Casual Connect and send mm -hmm. send an, an email and let them know how much you enjoyed it and how like you you'd like to see more because um, mm -hmm. it really does make a difference. And in Seattle, we've and San Francisco, we've built up the audio track to probably around 30 people in the audience usually. And it started, I swear to you, it was just like this, I remember. And so it's the first time here in a long, long time. It's not usually heavily advertised. And you know, there's only a certain amount of people that are gung-ho about audio, but I totally agree with you. Audio is so, so important in games, and that's why we're here. You know, I, I don't think it's just audio, I think it's like, creativity mm -hmm. in a way ha has been put uh, aside toward, uh, with all the focus on metrics and data and monetization. Um, there's a blog written by a guy named David Hum which is treating people like players, not users. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making games for people to enjoy the gameplay experience as a player, not a user, not a source of money. Um, so I think that's what we're doing here and the more we can refocus this conference towards creativity in games, mm. I think the better games are going to become mm -hmm. and uh, that's something I believe in and we all I think need to advocate for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Hello, my name is Garrett, and I'm a, a team lead game development for a company here. Uh, we focus on <coughs> casual games mostly, so uh, card games and dice games. Um, as you were saying, um, we're trying to streamline the, the process. Actually, we're working in a team of three people on the, on the game. Uh, these games last only have, pl have its playtime of two minutes or something. Um, now, I can tell my bosses that you need some audio to ground the people, so dice rolls and card flips, but mm -hmm. music is something that yeah, I've taken up myself because there's no money for it and <laughs> no time. Uh, how would I convince my boss to just make sure that uh, this creative process is still there? Find some top charting games that have really awesome <coughs> audio. Mm -hmm. which, you know, a lot of times the top charting games do have really good audio. Not always. Flapping Bird, I don't know. But <laughs> it's like the joke of the day. But really, seriously, find those ones that do it really, really, really well because there's some that are just absolutely amazing and say like, hey, you know, this is a missed opportunity. This is, you know, we have more chance of getting a hit if our players react really emotionally to the music. They want to hear it all the time. It takes them to a special place. It's immersive. And um, yeah, of course you can have a hit without good audio. You can have a hit without good art. You can have a hit with good, without good story, right? It's very rare to have something that has everything, but it's a missed opportunity. That's what I would say. Um, we run statistics on mm. the mute button. Ah, yes. So that's a, a battle I have to fight against. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> statistics that we find is more than 70 percent uh -huh. uses the mute button so that could of course tell that i'm not a good sound designer but right. apart from that so what you have to do is you have to hire a sound designer instead of doing it yourself so that it's really good and then no one wants to mute it the, okay. the other part of that is you know the audio budget is maybe five three percent of an entire spend so if 3% is creating a great experience for that 30%. That's pretty easy math in my mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. If the 30% of your 100,000 or million players are getting a great audio experience for 3% of your budget, why would you not do that? That seems like a 10 times benefit on your investment mm -hmm. uh, versus writing off 30% of people who are looking for that part of the experience yeah. when it's really actually easy and cheap. To, to do it. Well said. If everybody comes to Casual Connect in San Francisco next summer, I'm, I'm going to print up t-shirts that say like, hate the mute or mute button with a cross through it. I mean, for me personally, if I like say go to a casino, let's talk about casino games because they're really popular, right? If I sit down at a machine that doesn't have sound, I'm not going to play it because that's half the experience for me, at least half. But I'm an audio person. But, you know, I've seen other people get up and leave, you know, if it doesn't make any sound or it's really quiet and they can't adjust it. They, you know, it's part of the whole experience, I think. And I think it's completely applicable to casual games. I think there are certain people who play at work and whatever and they can't make any sound but that's only a certain percent. And you, so you have all these other people that are looking forward to hearing something really nice and cool. I, w I wonder what the difference is between um, iOS, you know, handheld devices, mm -hmm. tablets, and that sort of thing, what the mute, you know, what, the, what, what, what that would be as opposed to browser games. Because a lot of times the browser games, you play them at work, <coughs> you may not supposed to be, you know, playing, and you, and, and you mute them, but, you know, mm -hmm. when you have a tablet in your hand and you're playing a game, it seems like it's, like, you really do want to have the audio. Yeah, there. and a lot of people use headphones. We did, a, we did a flurry test on that, and we got, like, 78% of users actually listen to our games on iOS. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, 90% of the users in, like, Korea and China listen to our games. Mm -hmm. And we're just strictly iOS, okay, so. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. mostly iOS. So, another question. It was interesting how... Um, you're talking about casinos, and, and I'm sure it's similar with casinos, but retail and restaurants and cafes and chains put a huge amount of emphasis on the music as part of the ambiance, as part of that, you know, creating the environment that they want. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, I mean, it seems so relevant with this, uh, this space as well. I was just curious, you mentioned top grossing games that have kick-ass music, and I was wondering if from each of the panelists, you know, just rattle off one or two or three of your favorite games that have great music, or you feel like that really made a game click or work, or, you know, mm. something that we could kind of look to and, and, and study and learn from? Mm. <coughs> as far as, like, iOS, um, one of my favorite games is Infinity Blade. It definitely sounds really good. I really like the sound effects. It's pretty raw. Um, I also really like um, what is it, uh, Candy Crush. I think it sounds pretty good. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of old hat now, but when it came out, I loved Angry Birds because every bird had a, its own little character. And the other thing I loved about it, and as a sound designer, it's things that I notice, is that you know every bird that had every possible physical object, it made a different sound. So depending on how hard the object was, it was more of a clunk or a thunk or a thud or a you know some kind of sound. And to me, that was just really fun and immersive until I got bored of it. <laughs> but it was part of the experience, for sure. I actually, I actually agree. I mean, I, I hate to give more accolades to Candy Crush, but mm. it's got a really interesting musical score. I don't actually like the sound design that much, although there's an oddity to it that is kind of interesting <coughs> and like bizarrely compelling. But the music is like this weird, detuned, mm -hmm. kind of drunken, um, <laughs> like uh, psychedelic experience, and it's just got a really interesting I think it, it really resonates mood. with like the characters too like, right right it's like, like a dream it's like a nightmare dream kind of experience and that adds a lot to mm -hmm. you only have to hear it a few times um, and then maybe it does get tiresome and that's a whole nother question mm -hmm. is how to keep the experience fresh when you've got three loops playing for you know, hours or days of, of gameplay mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but I actually think slot machines Jesse's work is a great example of that too because there's so many themes and you jump mm -hmm. between them and each slot experience has to be fresh and exciting. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Okay. Well, let's move on to uh, the next slide, next discussion here. That was a good conversation. Um, so let's talk about gear a little bit. Let's see. So what kind of gear do you think is absolutely essential for someone starting out doing sound if they want to do a really good job? And what software would you recommend? Yeah, that's all, all over the map. Um, personally, I mean, I grew up, uh, I learned on Pro Tools. So we use Pro Tools at uh, Z2. Um, we're a Mac house, so we use Macs as our primary computer as well. Mm -hmm. um, get an interface, some good speakers, but even then, being able to play back on on your devices, right? Get a good, um, perfect power devices, so I don't know, iPod 4, iPhone 5, whatever. Mm -hmm. for, for me, I, I've been working in the casual games space since uh, 1999, and uh, I remember working on you know, on my computer back then. Um, it was a big computer and it cost a lot of money. Um, and these days, uh, you know, it's like you had to have a uh, different audio card. Right now, my, mm. my primary computer is uh, a MacBook Pro uh, that I bought last year. Um, I'm running Logic. I have probably 20 to 30 different soft synths of, you know, <coughs> every like free ones and very expensive ones mm -hmm. and um, and uh, a wireless mouse uh, probably four pairs of headphones and then um, you know ob obviously like you were saying you know you run it through as many devices as you can um, sometimes I think that um, at, my, at, uh, at double down we have really very high-end uh, reference monitors and sometimes you know it's like who's gonna really hear mm -hmm. this but I think it's good to like you know, like shoot for the the, the most fantastic audio you possibly can, and then when you're getting it down to you know these different devices and handheld devices and whatnot, you start tweaking your stuff for all the various you know artifacts and filters that, that all the various codecs introduce on, on these things. But I, mm -hmm. I I do pretty much like to like shoot for the best clearest audio possible like mm -hmm. if you're gonna listen to it on a st big stereo system you'd want to tap your toe or something mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, I, you said something that um, reminded me of basically you can have cheap tools, you can have expensive tools, it's not necessarily going to be better than the, than the other. Um, what matters is that you know how to use it right. and when to use it. And I know some people just buy a lot of gear and, and they never really fully know how to use it. And I think it's just about basically like being an expert at what you use and that makes a big difference. I know that uh, Fernando is uh, a certified audio engineer, right? And, and I am as well. And, and uh, you would maybe think that that's a little too much for working in casual games, but it actually has is, is been really, really helpful on, on a lot of these games. And um, So there. <laughs> yeah, if you know your tools, I mean, what you're working with, you can make magic with it, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, what really matters is, is that it sounds badass, right? So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. <laughs> if you make it sound incredible, then it doesn't really matter what tools you use. Okay. Great. So um, are there any questions about gear and technology and, and that sort of thing? I was wondering, uh, why isn't it common to use natural instruments in games like to record the uh, natural uh, instruments? Why oh, okay. isn't it counted as a tool? Like live instruments, you mean yeah, recorded instruments? Yeah. So uh, probably budget is Number is it one. only the budget or the actual experience? Does it have to be digital in a way? Uh, just in my experience, it just you can't afford it because you know if you want a good player, you have to pay them good money, and there's yeah. just no budget, and you're cutting out your your bottom line to do that. Um, but I have used like <coughs> sometimes I'll hire a violinist because strings are generally the hardest to sound real. There's so much dynamic contrast. So I record a violinist maybe like eight different times and create a string section out of them or maybe just a solo line. And that way it's not too expensive. So you think only the only reason is budget? Well, it's not the only reason. Some games don't have the right, I mean, they might not have the right sound for something live, I think. Well, what do you guys think? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, sort of your audience as well. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, in casual games, you have to be very mindful of your audience, and, you know, they're mostly um, women over 35 or over 40 or something like that. And, you know, like, I, I, I uh, sort of pride myself on my ability to write happy, cheesy little ditties um, that my mother will like. Because mm. she's my guinea pig. Do you send them to your mom? I do. I <gasps> do send them. I was like, what do you think I of this I never thought of that. Oh, I just think that was great. I just want it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, so from my own experience, when I was recording uh, the music for my last game, uh, I wanted to create, to do natural instruments, because mm. I already have an instrument. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing it, I thought uh, it was going to end up uh, not really polished, a uh, big experimental, so I thought it's a bad idea. Well, it's a whole skill to take live <coughs> instruments and make them sound super good. I mean, you have to be able to produce that well unless you have a virtuosic player who's playing it completely in tune and, and everything. And generally speaking, even if I have someone who plays in the symphony, I have to tweak some things and we have to take a lot of takes and I have to edit. So there's a lot of time and expertise that you, know, you would charge for. Finding a, mar a good marimba player? <laughs> hmm. Flame. I don't want to diss marimba players, but I know what you mean. <laughs> the other consideration is it's really hard to make changes. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to right. be like oh, done and yeah. then add that layer on versus in any sort of you know, creative stage. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you want to make a change mm -hmm. to a live performance, you, you can't. Totally. Uh, so. I will say this, though. Uh, what was about two years ago, three years ago, we did uh, Bayou. Yes, blast by class. blast for game house and uh, we it, they wanted a um, mm -hmm. um, zydeco zydeco and yeah. so we found this um, uh, accordion player and uh -huh. we took her into a big studio one of the best studios in Seattle and uh, you know we recorded you know a variety of, of, of content that we could use for you know sound effects and you know stingers and all sorts of stuff and it really in in, mm -hmm. in the end it was it was 
really fantastic work. Because accordion is one of those instruments that unless you're an expert on accordion, it's very difficult to sequence and program that it's accurately. It's extremely difficult. Because yeah. you've got to get all those little weird button <laughs> sounds. Those little air know? sounds. Right, and right. So yeah. it, that was, a, that was a, a good situation. Yeah. We actually did a similar thing with a harp. And a, a harp is actually, you'd think, a relatively easy mm -hmm. instrument to reproduce. Uh, and, and there are good mm -hmm. uh, tools for that, but the, the difference between a live harp performance mm -hmm. uh, with a, a good recording and something that you would play as a, as a composer uh, on a keyboard, I it's, it's night and day. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way the articulation and just how they approach the instrument, um, it, it was fantastic mm -hmm. uh, at the end, and it was worth doing it. Yeah. Cool. So when you're approaching a client who might be kind of pushing back and not wanting to pay for that extra, you know, authentic resource, mm -hmm. what is it you might tell them to kind of sell that art? If it's a if it's a genre that I feel like it will add a lot to, because some genres, like what Jesse said, like if it's a really just cute electronic style, it's not really necessarily needed. But in like an orchestral setting, say, or something where there's a really exposed like solo line where it's going to be like so much better. So I'll send them, you know, another track that's similar, one with like a really awful, like cheesy MIDI sample. I don't choose like a really good one, you know. And then I like play the live like flute for them. It's like, look at the big difference, you know. And yeah, there's a lot of layers in between, but like, this, that's a difference, so is that worth it to you? This is how much it'll cost, and that's what I've done in the past, so. Yeah, a lot of the times I like to write in the notes and then later just play on top of it, like a live instrument, like a mm -hmm. drum or something like that, just yeah. to add that, that element. Granted, you can't record, I don't know, violins and cellos and all that that I would really like, but, you know, if I could at least, if I could at least you know, I don't know, add in a shaker or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That brings up a good point. It's a lot of sound designers and composers are multi instrumentalists, and so you just—it's very cheap that way. I mean, it's cost saving for the client. So, if you can play a bunch of instruments, then you don't have to really charge a lot of extra because you're not paying someone a lot of extra. So, yeah. All right. Next slide. Let's see what we got. Okay. I love this topic. Artistic integrity <coughs> versus pleasing your client. <laughs> this is something I personally have learned. You know, you start out and you compose and you think, oh, this is my baby, this is my song, and then they come back and they say like, it's too melodic, and you know, oh, what's that awful wrong note? Oh, that's called dissonance, and it happens in music, that sort of thing. So. What do you do in a situation, of course the client is right and it's for their game, right? But they've hired you, you're the expert. How do you communicate with difficult clients when they want you to change something that you think is really going to make the end result suffer? Has that ever happened to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many times in the last year? <laughs> that happens to us all, all the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm in a fortunate position in uh, that I'm not the composer, mm. and so I can work as an intermediary mm. in between the, the, the feedback and the composer mm -hmm. to help. I, I think a lot of times feedback comes back from a client, and they don't actually even really mean what they say. They kind of mean something different, mm -hmm. and someone has to interpret what mm -hmm. they're actually trying to communicate. Um, we've had a lot of problems where feedback was directly just passed over to the composer, composer makes the change, we pass it over, and the client's not happy, and then that loop happens, and it, which is a real problem, mm -hmm. because it's, it, someone has to step in that's got a little perspective and say, oh, no, 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 no. yeah, no, they don't mean this, what they mean is that. Mm -hmm. You make that very subtle shift, and all of a sudden, everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. um, so there's almost like a third step that's sometimes missing mm -hmm. from the feedback process that that is really helpful um, to preserve the artist's integrity because you don't want composers don't want to be frustrated and feel like their work is appreciated, mm -hmm. uh, but you also have to give the client what they want. Yeah. So there's something in the middle there. Right. That's actually really important that gets missed a lot. And yeah. that that something in the middle is uh, language. 
mm -hmm. we've talked about this before on, on, on panels, it's like um, when you're talking about audio with, with clients or other composers or, or uh, audio designers, I mean, you know, it's, it's it, you have to be, it's tough to be really specific when you're talking about the feelings that music gives you mm -hmm. or, or, you know, you know, uh, in, 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 in compasses. Um, and, and so somebody can sit there and say, well, I, I really like this piece of music, but I, I just think that it's, you know, there's that one note that's really, or it's, it's really abstract. It's a very mm -hmm. abstract thing that people say. It's like, well, I just, it sounds so horrible or, <laughs> you know. Very subjective, yeah. Yeah, it's, but, but, you know, it's, it's trying to talk to your, talk to your, your client and really try to, you know, get them to express in several different ways just exactly what it is they really, you know, they, they feel and what, you know, mm -hmm. are you talking about timbre? Are you talking about tempo? Are you talking about, you know, these bass notes? Are you talking about these high notes? You know, you kind of really got to drill in to, to talk to them about, you mm -hmm. know, get them to express themselves and, and, and yeah. talk about what they're, what, what these, these feelings are. Right. And I think it's, you know, important to tell developers that you don't have to use musical terms you know, obviously right. they're not musicians and that's totally fine and there's no judgment and there's no, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's just trying to make something clear. So, you know, if someone says oh, that sounds, you know, too, too sad, or too then or you have to just narrow down on like what's too sad about it, you and know. And also it's really important to not take your, I mean, you know, like if, if you're writing songs for your for your debut record, that's you know going to turn you into like you know the next Justin Bieber. Okay, you know, maybe this is <laughs> minus totally the arrest right. doesn't work. <laughs> but um, when you're creating music for a client, um, you know, you, you have to just kind of like swallow your pride and and mm -hmm. really work with work with them because it's you really shouldn't take it personally. Like no. you know, this is a this is a job. And you know you're using your skills as a composer or an audio designer to you know make your client happy, right? And so you have to <coughs> work within those parameters. Yeah. Don't take it to heart. Um, temping is really important. Just make music up front. Take it from wherever. Mm -hmm. You know it's a great way to get that ball rolling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are my two. Mm -hmm. my two and I really yes. appreciate developers that have one point person. Right. There's there's a real problem with with having the whole team. It sounds like a great idea, like we're all a team and we all have an opinion, but there's nothing worse than being in a room with a programmer and an artist and and like producer and everyone else and trying to keep everyone happy because music is so subjective that you can't make everyone happy. So it's okay if that meeting happens. And then it needs to be like whittled down into like, what are you going to tell the professional sound person? Or else there's just too many opinions and it's like, it's, it's going to make the product suffer by trying to make everyone happy. It loses, it loses its character. In, in, in my experience of being in-house in two different, you know, pretty uh, established casual game companies, um, it doesn't seem like everybody has an opinion about the art or the, the, the code or the physics of a game, but everybody, everybody <laughs> has an opinion about the music. Everybody from, you know, the marketing mm -hmm. people to the, the programmers to the artists, you know, e everybody, they all have and they will all tell you, you know, well, I either like it or, well, I just think it's inappropriate, you know, it's like people will, will, they'll totally tell you. It's the American Idol mentality, I call it. Yeah, it's, re it's really bizarre. Yeah, what yeah, were you going to say, Nick? Well, on the sound design side, one sort of recommendation is not to deliver just raw sounds mm. and have people listen to sound effects mm. out of context mm -hmm. yeah. because you'll get just useless revisions mm -hmm. and people won't understand the yep. final vision. Yeah. So for us, it's we almost never deliver mm -hmm. sounds yeah. um, that aren't against picture and that usually have music attached yeah. right. so, That's so they really can hear the whole package right. because otherwise you're just setting yourself up for you know, feedback on every single sound. Yeah, that's too loud, that's too quiet. Yeah, it just, it, you know, it, who knows what it's going to be because it, yeah. they haven't, <coughs> yeah. they, can't, they can't hear how it all sounds right. together yet. And a lot of times what I do is I play the loop that would happen when all those sounds happen and I just play every sound. Yeah. And, and that right there makes a huge difference because yeah. they're not naked, like, yeah. individual Raw. assets. Yeah. yeah. Questions about this topic there's a lot of other things on there so something about 
how to communicate with clients. Any questions about that? All right. So what I'm going to do, because there's just one minute left, is I'm just going to open it up to a couple of questions that can have to do with anything about game audio. So speak now, or forever wish you asked. <laughs> do you think there is a relationship between sound art and, uh, and contemporary art? Between what? Say it again? Between sound art and the contemporary art world and uh, sound design and games. Because they have, they both have the, the playfulness uh, and the pr practicality also in the experience. So do you think there is a connection between these two fields? By contemporary art, you mean like visual art or? Uh, sound art. Okay. So I just think there's connection because I'm both I'm working in the both fields, so I thought uh, same it's the same process actually, the same result. Any comments about that? <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Yes. So is there you're asking if there's any comparison between making sound for games yes, and yes, exactly. art. And art as sound. Art as sound. Yeah, like sound sculptures. Sound sculpt. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. So, have you ever seen sound sculptures where you like go out and there's like, you know, there's an audio presentation that is happening and there might be something to look at and, but it's mostly the sound like tells a story. Have you seen that? It's oh, pretty cool well, stuff. I think I think uh, we're talking about two different things: art and design, right? Design is art with a purpose, right? And art can just be what it is. Mm -hmm. You just enjoy it for what it is, right? Um, a lot of the times the client will come up to you and say, hey, I need this to be, I don't know, sad or happy. And sure, there will be art involved with that because you're trying to create content for that. But again, you're designing, right? You're designing that musical composition for that purpose, for it to be sad or happy or, or a battle theme or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely an artistic side to it, but I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it goes back to designing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would say, um, you know, what they have in common is is, is art. The, the goal of art is to is to evoke some emotion within mm -hmm. the viewer, and, and it's the same goal in games. I mean, you you're, you're trying to um, evoke some emotional response from the player, mm -hmm. and um, so in that sense, um, there are definitely commonalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I can visualize if that can be done in a really creative way. It could make something awesome. I don't think it could work for every game. But in certain settings, I think that would be really cool. Any other questions up here? <coughs> Maybe wait for the mic. I don't play a lot of games, so I was wondering... Um, Get out! <laughs> no, just kidding. What are, what, are some, um, what are some games out right now Maybe what are some casual games out right now that you guys um, would say uh, are good representations of? of Were you in the room when we answered this question? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> well, we answered that question, so we'll tell you after. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So uh, give a round of applause to all of our panelists here. Mm -hmm.